Well, good morning, church family. Go ahead and make your way in. Stand up together. We're going to worship. I want to read this scripture over us. We've gathered this morning to be in the house of the Lord, to worship together, to set our eyes on Christ. It says this in Psalm 3, verse 8. It says this, salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. What a truth to focus on this morning. So let's go ahead and stand together. We'll sing. Let's get those hands together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, we sing when I fight. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Come on, you sing. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And Almighty Force, you go, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. So when 
the Lord this morning. He's faithful to us. Well, hey, we're going to move into a time of communion. If you didn't grab a communion element on your way in, you could just raise your hand and an usher will bring that to you. But we've already been declaring this morning that the battle belongs to the Lord, that our salvation has been won in the Lord at the cross, that we belong to him and our victory is found in him. And what a great way to celebrate this morning than to set our eyes on the cross, to remember the cross. And so we're gonna do that through communion this morning. And I'd love to just call this verse to mind as we prepare our hearts. It says this in Romans 12, verse one and three. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. May that be us this morning. May we have our eyes set on Christ. May we not think highly of ourselves. May we be lowly before the Lord. May we examine ourselves as living sacrifices, are we holy and pleasing and acceptable to God? Do that now as we sing and prepare to take communion together.
the cross for my salvation. We thank you, Lord, the Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin erased. It was my death you died. I am raised to life. Hallelujah. Savior lifted up. There is no greater. Come on, we exalt him in this place. There is no greater love. There is Celebration, and, and we've probably sung it in maybe too much of a celebration type way uh, for this moment because I think the important moment right now is more reflection than celebration. Um, there's much reflection in that song that we just sung. The Lamb of God in my place. Have you thought about that? As we come to participate in this supper together as we gather at the table thinking about the lamb and the life that he lived, the sacrifice that was made, the blood that was shed. Reflect with me on the reality that it's in my place. The death that he died was supposed to be your death. And yet he lovingly, sacrificially offered up his life for us. Reflect upon that. Let's bow our heads cry out to our God. Let's just have a moment of thanksgiving where we once again, like what we probably often do, let's just thank God for the gospel. Let's thank Jesus for the life and the death and the resurrection on our behalf so that one day each of us can experience that eternal glorification.
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for dying our death. We thank you for leaving heaven's glory, taking on humanity, living a life of suffering, all for the purpose of our future glorification. Thank you for going to that cross. Thank you for paying for our sin. Sinners who so often we, we cheapen your grace on a weekly basis, living for ourselves, no thought of the pain and the suffering and the agony that took place on the cross on our behalf. Thank you for your love. We're grateful for you this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes these words to the church at Corinth, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and we had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do this together. In the same way also, he took the cup after cupper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. And then Paul, he closes with these words, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, every time we are celebrating this meal together, every time we are thinking about the life, the death, the resurrection, our future glorification, uh, we're, we're proclaiming something to each other. We're proclaiming the reality that it's finished. Aren't you grateful for that? The transaction has been made complete. And so let's stand together and let's celebrate that together. Let's celebrate the wonder, the beauty, the awesomeness of our God and the fact that he would pursue after us so that we can spend eternity with him. And nothing comes close to the Lord. Oh, mighty, nothing as sweet as your love. And mercy, nothing comes close to the Lord. Oh, mighty, nothing as sweet as your love. And mercy, nothing comes close. Sing a song of thanks. Nothing comes close to the Lord.
Just the voices we sing. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Come on, let's thank the Lord together. Let's lift up a shout of praise. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy. And yes, Lord, as we continue to worship, Lord, we know that that is, that is true. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and every heart will know how great you are. Uh, so we praise you this morning, and we just thank you, Lord. We've tasted of the goodness of the Lord, and our heart is that all so we bless this time we set apart in your name and meet with us in power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Vertical Church. Hey, and uh, welcome. Those of you who are here for the first time, we are pumped that you chose to worship with us this morning. We hope our service has already been encouragement to you as we have reflected upon the beauty of our Savior and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I really do hope that our service today will be an encouragement to you and that you might see Jesus in a more clear way than maybe even um, the way you entered this morning, and that's the prayer for my heart, that's the prayer for, every, for, for should be the prayer for all our hearts, uh, that as we come into this place today, as we, that we will see a greater um, glimpse of who our Savior is, Jesus Christ. If you are visiting with us on your way out today, uh, we do have a Guest Connect room, it's kind of like that room on the right hand side, if you would stop by that room, um, I have a gift that I would like to give to you. Uh, we're so grateful that you chose to worship with us. If you could do us one favor, there is in a seat in front of you, there's probably a, a Connect card. If you could grab one of those cards and if you could fill it out um, and turn it in to our info center on your way out, or you can just grab your phone and scan that barcode and um, you can fill it out electronically. We sure would appreciate it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. A phrase that I hate to hear. You're doing it wrong. Maybe some of you heard that phrase this week from a boss. Maybe you were filling out a reimbursement receipt 
And you heard that phrase. Maybe uh, you heard it from your professor regarding the footnoting on your paper. Maybe you heard it from your coach because you were not making the correct play. Maybe you heard it from a parent in reference to the way that you're making your bed. You're doing it wrong. The reason I hate that phrase, or even, I, I would say this, the worst phrase is you did it wrong, right? You did it wrong. But the reason I hate those phrases is because it's, wor- it's more work for me, right? It's more work for you. When you hear that phrase, you know what they're getting to. Like something has got to change. Now, now I don't know about you guys, and, and if you're a regular attender of Vertical Church, you know this to be true about me, but I'm not the, like the most handy guy in the world. And I remember when my, my oldest boys, about, I don't know, probably about 15 years ago, um, they were really into basketball, and so they wanted a basketball hoop. And so, like what every father is supposed to do, he's supposed to take the trip out to Walmart or Costco, I forget where we got it, but we bought ourselves a basketball hoop, and then it was my job, it was my job to assemble that basketball hoop. How many of you have ever assembled the basketball hoop? All right, probably for you guys, probably you did a lot better job than I did, I don't know, I hope you did, but I went through like the the two-hour ordeal of setting up this hoop, and everything was perfect, except for the fact that when I stood that thing up vertically, the rim looked like that. It was raised by about two inches, and it wasn't level. And in order for me to fix that small little part that was affecting the rim... From going about two inches at an angle, I had to take the whole thing apart. I had to start all over. Now, although we hate to hear that phrase, you're doing it wrong or you did it wrong, we have to get it right because of what's at stake. For my kids, especially, like, listen, I've shot enough air balls for the family. (laughs) You know what I mean? I don't want them shooting air balls because they grew up shooting on a hoop like this, all right? What's at stake requires us to make the needed adjustments. And this leads us to the big idea from the passage today. Ministry, ministry, the way we operate within our church family, the way that we serve each other in the body of Christ, ministry must be done rightly so that we can reach the culture missionally. Ministry must be done rightly so that we can reach the culture missionally, meaning there's a right way, there's a right way, and there's also a wrong way to do ministry in the local church. And ministry the right way is essential if we want to be missional. So it's essential for us as a church family to figure out what the requirements are for doing ministry the right way. If this is your first time here, at Vertical Church. We're going verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written to a church plant just like us. We've called this series, the whole book, we're calling it Messy Church because this church was a mess. And one reason they were in such a mess is because they were doing a lot of things wrong. I would say almost everything that they were doing was wrong. For example, there was a large group of people in the church who were making a really big deal about the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically the gift of tongues. And, and because they were creating such a big deal about this gift, it started cr- to create a lot of tension and division, and ultimately it affected their ability to accomplish the mission. So if you're new to Vertical Church, what you have to understand And really, it should be the the primary focus of every Christian, like our job is the mission. And meaning, our job is to make disciples. So when you walk into our church, we have on our back wall, it says, love selflessly, live sacrificially, and lead strategically. The reason why those words are on our wall, because that's what a disciple does. Jesus says in Mark 8, 34, if you want to be a disciple of mine, he says, you need to deny yourself. That means love selflessly. You need to take up the cross. That means live sacrificially. And then he says, you have to follow after me. Jesus' life was one of leadership. You need to lead strategically. You need to pour into others 
as a disciple, you need to be making disciples so that the kingdom can spread, so that the kingdom can go forward. And of course, this church, the church at Corinth, like because of all this tension and division, the mission has stopped. It's stalled. They're not getting anywhere. They're not reaching the culture. And of course, St. Paul, right? St. Paul? Call him St. Paul. St. Paul wasn't always so saintly. In fact, St. Paul, some of you are going to be disappointed to know, when you meet Paul, he was kind of a fiery kind of a guy. And in this letter, he's pretty fired up because he's just poured into this church probably more than any other church. Like he spent 18 months with this church, like evangelizing them and then equipping them and exhorting them and encouraging them because Corinth was in a strategic location that would enable the gospel to flourish. And so knowing that they were in a strategic location, Paul pours into this church and now the gospel stalled. The gospel isn't moving forward. So what does Paul do? What does Paul do? He says, we need to correct some things. We need to fix some things. And one of the things that we need to fix, need to fix so that you can do the mission is the way that you as a church family are doing ministry. Ministry must be done rightly so we can reach the culture missionally. We have two points for today. Here we go. Doing ministry rightly requires, number one, my message must be cogent. My message must be cogent. Now, I love that word cogent, and my wife told me, she's like, I don't even know what that word means, all right? And I had like a second person. What does that mean? So I'm going to provide some clarity. It's a really good word, okay? Cogent means clear, logical, and convincing. Clear, logical, and convincing. The lawyers in the room have a very good understanding of this word cogent. When they're arguing a case... And we as Christians, frankly, we're always, or we ought to always be arguing a case for Christianity, correct? I mean, we need to be living on mission, so our message must be cogent. Insider walls and outsider walls. We're making disciples in here, we're making disciples out there, so our message must be cogent. Look at what Paul says, though, in verse 1. He says, starting in verse 1, he says, pursue love. Now, when Paul says pursue love, he's saying simply this, Christian, he's saying Make love your aim. He, he, that word pursue, it's to pursue. It's the idea of, of pursuing an enemy. Just as the infantry would go hard after their enemy, this same Greek word is the word that Paul's using. He's saying, hey, go hard after love. And everything Paul said previously about love in chapter 13 He's saying, hey, listen, Christian, you need to be chasing it down. You need to be going hard after it. You need to be pressing in on love. These things that we just discussed, he's saying in chapter 13, they're not optional. We're going hard after them. But notice what he says next. He says, and, and you may want to underline that word if you're an underliner in the Bible. And and, and just for me, like, do it really straight. Do it really straight. Okay, I'm that nerd that breaks out the ruler and the micron pens, and I make sure it's really straight. Just do that for me. But underline that word and. He says and, he says pursue love, press hard after love, and he says and, and desire spiritual gifts. Now just a little review as we talk about spiritual gifts because I have a feeling that maybe a few of the things I'm going to say today might be not purposely controversial, but it might be a little bit different than maybe what you have heard Um, growing up. And and so I just want to review something really quickly. If you go back to chapter 13, in chapter 13, Paul says, I think it's in verse 8, he says, although spiritual gifts are partial, the gifts are, they're they're partial. He says that they're still, they're still operable until the perfect comes. What's the perfect? And we talked about this last week, but if you weren't with us, just a little review so we're all on the same page. The perfect is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the perfect. So, So the gifts are still operable. And knowing that, Paul says, he says, hey, Christian, desire them. That word desire, like you ought to have zeal. Just like, and, and this is the word that he used, I think it's in chapter, the end of chapter 9, 
when he's talking about the, the runner pursuing the, the prize, right? And, and specifically, he's, he's referencing we're all runners and, and, and the prize is souls, right? We're supposed to be pursuing hard after lost people. Remember that in chapter 9? Here's the same word, and he's saying, hey, just like the athlete who desires the prize, and he desires to win the race, therefore he has all the right priorities, and there's practice, and there's perseverance, there are no off days, there's performance. He says, Christian, that ought to be you when it comes to spiritual gifts. You're to be like that athlete who is prioritizing spiritual gifts and practicing spiritual gifts and persevering even in life's difficulties and still doing ministry and using your gifts. There's no timeouts. Performing the gifts. That's the picture that Paul wants. We say around here, it's on our wall near the cafe, we say every, mi- every member is a minister. Yeah. But here he's drawing our attention to the reality of, he's basically saying the church of Corinth, every member is a minister and a lover. That's what he's saying here. Every member is a minister and a lover. Now think with me for a moment. Why would Paul say pursue love and desire spiritual gifts? Why would Paul say that? Why would he say pursue love and desire spiritual gifts? And here's why. Because the combo makes things better and more complete. So just think about, I've been on this diet for a couple weeks. Um, I'm heartbroken over the reality that Brad Crump is the only person that has drawn attention to the fact that I've lost some weight, but I'm not taking it personal. I've been on this diet. I don't know what that says about Brad. <laughs> yeah, all right, thank you, man. <laughs> but I've been on this diet, and let me tell you something, man. Like, it's tough. It's tough. And even as I was doing this, sermon and, 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 and preparing this sermon, I just started thinking about the five greatest food combinations ever. Now, for those of you who are my friends on Facebook, we had some fun this week narrowing down what I consider or what the, the global Matt McCarthy friendship Facebook community considers to be the five greatest food, back, food combos ever. So we had to eliminate a couple options. I was disheartened to see this one go. Here it is. Number one, cake and ice cream. Like, people were basically saying, you, like, hey, hey, listen, people were like, well, you can have cake and enjoy cake, and you can also have ice cream and enjoy ice cream. But listen, the reason why I'm on this diet, because I like two desserts. So I'm like, I think they need to go together, but others were saying, no, they don't need to go together. So we eliminated cake and ice cream. That was tough for me to eliminate, let me just tell you. And then the second one I was surprised to see go was this one, mashed potatoes and gravy. Because people are like, man, if you make mashed potatoes the right way, they should taste like hot vanilla ice cream. You're not going to need any gravy. And plus, you can put gravy on biscuits. So I was like, all right, that one will go too. So here are, the, here, are the, here are the top five greatest food combinations ever based upon me and my Facebook friends, all right? And you, hopefully you had the opportunity to vote. Number five, eggs and bacon. Eggs and bacon. Like, let's be honest, man. Eggs are good, but you stack some bacon on those eggs, it changes the whole breakfast. Number four, Burger and fries. I mean, look at that thing. This is probably the wrong time for me to be doing this, right? I mean, burger and fries, man. Like, like, burgers are good and fries are good, but man, when they're together, oh, man, good night. And then how about this one? Spaghetti and meatballs. I mean, come on. Spaghetti, but then when you add the meatball, oh, man, it just, it's a game changer. And, and then there's this one, chips and salsa. How many of you chips and salsa people? Oh, man. I could just every day eat chips and salsa. Then last but not least, the one I grew up having every day in elementary school. Come on, don't disrespect it. (laughs) Don't disrespect it. Number one, peanut butter and jelly. Nothing better than a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Left to themselves, they're all fine. I'll eat a peanut butter sandwich. I'll eat a toast and butter jelly sandwich. Left to themselves, they're all fine, but the combo makes them deadly. So Paul's like, you want to, and here's the connection point. Paul's like, we need this deadly combo as Christians. You can have one, you can pursue love, and you can have the other. You can desire the gifts. But Paul's like, guys, Christians, listen, if you combine those two things together, like, it's a game changer. Because oftentimes, there are churches that are really, really good at loving, right? 
but they're not so good at the ministry side of things and doing the, exercising the gifts. And then there are some churches that are really good over here at the gifts, but they're not so good at the love. And Paul's like, you need both. Make it a combo. Combine your love with your spiritual gifts. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, speak the truth in love. There's a combo there. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Do everything, all your gifts in love. Love, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on, and here's the list, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. That's a list right there, man. Woo! Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you. And then he closes this way, so you are also to forgive. And then he says, and above all, put on love. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. You're to bind around your neck steadfast love and faithfulness. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And and notice this, verse 4. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Isn't that interesting? That's why Paul's writing this. Pursue love and, and the gifts. Because when you bind those things around your neck, and Paul would have known the law. He would have had this memorized. He's probably thinking about this verse when he's writing to the Corinthians. Because when you have those two things going on, church family, when we have them, we are going to find favor and good success in the sight of God. That's a winner, huh? But also, man, we must pursue love. And we must desire spiritual gifts. Listen, church family, this is not optional. You can choose to have cake without the ice cream. You can choose to have the mashed potatoes without the gravy. But love without spiritual gifts is not optional if we want to be missional. Paul is, and and, and listen, you have to understand something. These two verbs, they're, they're commands and they're ongoing. They're to never stop. Now, real quick, notice the gift that Paul elevates, though. He says, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, and notice the gift he highlights. He, and, and, and he's correcting the Corinthians because what were they highlighting? What gift were they highlighting? What were they highlighting? Tongues. Notice what Paul highlights. He says, especially that you may prophesy. Now, now prophecy is a key word in chapter 14. It occurs like seven or eight times. And and here's what Paul's doing when he shares that word that many times. He's wanting to normalize prophecy and minimize tongues in every church family. That's what he's trying to do here. He's making a point. And now, now some of you, even right now, you're like, hold on a second, that ain't me. I'm out on this one. Well, Well, here's the thing. We've been saying over and over that this letter that Paul is writing... It's an occasional document, right? It's an occasional document. It's for a specific purpose. He's writing to this church because they have a problem emphasizing tongues over prophecy. It's an occasional document. However, there are some timeless principles for us. There's a reason why this has been canonized. And in fact, that word you is plural. So he's speaking to the entire congregation of Corinth. And I would say based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when he says to the church at Corinth and all the churches, he's speaking to all of us here today in the 21st century church. And he's reminding us that every person in a church family ought to desire spiritual gifts and the gift of prophecy. Now, let's get the definition. Do I have the definition of prophecy up here for these guys? Here we go. Yeah, perfect. Just a reminder. Here's prophecy. A message from God through the Spirit in the moment for the purpose of three things. Edification, direction, and encouragement. Message from God through the Spirit for the purpose of edification, direction, and encouragement. And and I I might even add on that in everyday language. Okay? The the, the listener can't understand you if if they don't understand the language. If if it's a real language, you really have the real gift of tongues. Because that's what tongues is. Go to Acts chapter 2. We can argue that privately. 
I'm not going to prove that point. I've already talked about it. Acts chapter 2, the tongue was a real language. And I believe in tongues. I still believe in tongues today. But it's a real language. And so the issue that Paul's making here, though, is he says, hey, hey, prophesy. And there's two types of prophecy. You might want to put this down. There's what we would call a word of wisdom. And it's not on the screen. I apologize. I should have added that. A word of wisdom, which is basically it's an insight into an issue in, person, in a person's life. It doesn't have a chapter and a verse, but, 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 but the gift of prophecy, you're, you're able to speak a word of wisdom into someone's life. I've experienced that many times. And then there's the word of knowledge, knowing what to say about a situation. It typically ought to sound something like this. God might be leading you to, that's a key phrase, God might be leading you to. I don't know if it's from God or not, or the pizza I ate last night, or the pizza I wish I ate last night, because I'm on this crazy diet. But we have to be very careful when we do speak in a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. You don't know if it's from God. Let's get that out there. And, let, and furthermore, let me just make some points on prophecy really quickly. Number one, what Paul is talking about here is different than the office of a prophet. That's really important. Some of you, you're a little bit creeped out right now. But you're like, this guy's talking about prophecy. Does he think he's a prophet? I don't think I'm a prophet, okay? Hey, I'm not going to talk about the $60 million jet that the Lord is <laughs> revealing to me that we must go get. I'm glad I got one chuckle, at least. It was a joke. It was a joke. We're not going for the $60 million jet. That's not of God. That's of greed. Points on prophesying. Different than the office of a prophet. Prophecy or prophesying, it's distinct from the prophets that are spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, because it talks about the apostles and the prophets of the foundation of the church. That's not what we're talking about here. Number two, it's not foretelling the future or new doctrine. When we talk about prophecy... We're not talking about foretelling the future or new doctrine. Like, we're not creating this whole Christian psychic network this morning, okay? Prophets, they did predict and tell of new doctrine. And that's the reason why they're the foundation of the church along with the apostles. That's not what we're talking about. Number three, it's not authoritative. It's not authoritative. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20 is a great verse that you might want to look at, you might want to put down next to that it's not authoritative. Well, here's what Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica. He says, do not despise prophesying. So let's not despise this gift. It's a good gift. Let's not despise it. Let's not eliminate it. Do not despise prophesying. But then he says this, but test everything. That's huge. Test everything. Weigh it out. Specifically, weigh it out with scripture. So, like, when the guy comes to me, because this has happened, and says, I believe that God's telling me to divorce my wife, I'm like, nah, wrong. Wrong. You're not weighing it with scripture. God hates divorce. So, Paul writes, do not despise prophesying, but test everything, and then he says this, hold fast to what is good. So, even as people speak into our life, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, what we have to do is we need to weigh it out. We need to go to scripture. Am I getting good biblical godly counsel? Would this be from the Lord? Does it match scripture? And then we're weighing it. Is this right for me? I remember one time um, when I was a little preacher boy. I was in college, Bible major. Oh yeah. And this is what they did to us preacher boys. We'd go out and preach. And I went to a country church, man. I shucked the corn. Let me tell you, I had people coming to me afterwards, and I had this one old lady prophesying over me. She said, your, your ministry is starting out small. And I had this just even recently with another pastor. You know, you're going to, your, your, your ministry, because of the, the highway, and he started talking about highways. It was really cool. I mean, these people mean well, but like, you know, I'm looking back now, and it's like, it hasn't happened yet. What they were saying didn't really happen. So we've got to be really careful with prophecy. Prophecy must never be elevated above Scripture. It's not greater than Scripture. Number four, it's common in all times and places. It continues even today. It's for the benefit of the body. That's Paul's whole point. And then number five, both men and women did it. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 11? There were ladies in the church. They had those little doily things on their head, I think. I don't know what they were, right? 
or they weren't having the doily thing on the head. And Paul's like, hey, you're prophesying without the doily. <laughs> go put the doily on and then go prophesy. Number six, when we prophesy, it must always submit to Scripture. And I've kind of hinted at that. And you can cross-reference 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, which we'll see in a couple weeks. But here's the problem with prophecy. Many people abuse it today, so we kind of run from it sometimes. So let me share with you a real-life example of what prophecy looked like for me this week. All right, so as many of you know, we shot out a text. If you're not on our text thread, um, fill out that card, drop it by the info center, and just say, hey, I want to be on the church text thread. But we texted out this week that I was going to be doing some leadership training with Iranian church leaders. I was doing that on Thursday morning. I spent some time training Iranian church leaders. And you need to be praying for Iran. Only about half the class was on the call because there's this huge uprising in Iran right now, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, maybe I'll talk about it another time. We actually might send it out in an email. But our news doesn't cover this kind of stuff. But basically, the internet has essentially been shut off in Iran because there's this huge coup that's taking place right now. And so I'm ministering to these Iranian Christians, but prior to my ministry with them, I prayed for two things. Now, this would probably freak a couple of you out, and I apologize, but it's what I pray for. I pray for tongues, because I don't like using interpreters. I never know what they're saying. So I pray for tongues. But the second thing that I pray for is prophecy. Prophecy. And specifically, as I was preparing to lead these church leaders, I was praying over three different things. What I might teach them and how I might train them. Because how do I, as a Western Christian, even know what to talk about with an Iranian Christian who's facing persecution and who could be arrested and imprisoned for about six or eight months just for being caught on this call? Like, what am I supposed to say? That's a lot of pressure. So I'm crying out to the Lord, Lord, show me what to say. And I chose a leadership talk called Leadership Lessons from the Lord. And ironically, it's not the one that I wanted to teach. Like in my heart, it's like, I really want to teach this. But the Lord kept saying, teach this. I'm like, but Lord, I really want to teach this. I really like this one. But I kept going back to that. ever happened to you? And so I do the talk. And you guys remember Joe, Joe Connor, right? The English guy? He calls, hey, mate, how'd the call go? Is that Australian or is that English? He said, mate, okay? Hey, mate, how'd the call go? I'm like, man, I, I, think, I think it went well. He goes, well, let me just say, I already heard back. It was perfect. It was just what they needed. Isn't that cool? I didn't know what to do. And I was torn between a few things. And, and I didn't even know. I was giving them a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. That is biblical prophecy right there. That would be an example of biblical prophecy. That's what Paul's talking about. So he's like, that's why we pursue prophecy over tongues. That's why we pursue prophecy over tongues. Look what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, for the person who speaks in a tongue, now again, it's the ability to speak. We, we, we defined this before. A tongue is the ability to speak a previously unknown language. Acts chapter 2 style. That's where you see it every time biblically. It's not just crazy talk. I was watching a thing this week. Like, go on YouTube, man. These guys, it's really sad. I was watching a thing this week. This one guy was saying, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. Say the first syllable that comes to your mind. Say it, say it, say it right now. And then he caught himself. He's like, it's real. Oh, really? Oh, it's a language, folks. We got to be careful. We got to know our Bible. We got to be Bible studies because it's very emotional. He says, verse 2, for the person who speaks in a tongue, he says, is not speaking to people but to God. Since no one understands him, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. So this week, I have a little example. Um, I was texting with my son Isaiah. He wasn't, he wasn't feeling well this week. And so I started texting my son Isaiah. And I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? So if we could get that text exchange up on the screen. Here's, here's our text exchange. Take a look at it. Can, can you guys read that? And I'm like, hey, how did your meeting go today? That's me in the blue. And, and he says to me, it was fine. Are you getting Owen? And I'm like, I can. You going bone? Question mark. And then I corrected it. Home. You going home? He goes, yeah, my head no bueno. Now, I know that one right there. My head no good. I get that. And then I say to him, because I'm, I'm getting ready to start a meeting, I'll talk to you at home. And then he says, me nariz not moi. And I say to him, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and he says, my nose very bad, Spanish. 
How's this week? The message my son was giving a mystery. That's the point right there. What is a mystery? Here's what a mystery is, biblically. A mystery, do we have this on the screen, mystery? Did we define this? No. Mystery is something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. You look at scripture. Behold, there will be a mystery. What's the mystery? Something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. And, and here's the deal with my son. I need, it was a mystery. I needed an interpreter. Otherwise, I'm left out of the loop. That's Paul's point to the Corinthians. For the listener, tongues isn't cogent. It's not clear. It's not logical. It's not convincing. It won't cause someone to understand and believe. Only God can understand the tongue. So notice what Paul goes on to say in verse 3. He says, this is really important. And, and let me just say this, side note, it's, it's really important to grab a hold of because Paul explains why when we minister, our message must be cogent because it, it adds value. It, it strengthens others, it supports others, and it soothes others. Look what he says. He says, on the other hand, on the other hand, I had some fun thinking about that this week. I mean, think about that. That phrase, we've been using for over 2,000 years. Well, on the other hand, isn't that kind of cool? I feel more connected to the church at Corinth. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. Strengthening is literally used for the building of a house. It was used for building something. Encouragement is, is coming to one side or aid for providing comfort. Consolation was a secular Greek word, especially used in connection with death or other tragic events. And it's this idea of speaking kindly and soothingly for the purpose of comfort. And Paul's point is that the Christian life, here's, here's the whole point, here's why we pursue the gift, and especially the gift of prophecy, is because the Christian life is full of sin. Like people are going to go wayward, and it's full of setbacks in our spiritual life. And there are struggles. There's financial struggles. There's academic struggles. There, there are a whole lot of struggles. And, and there's suffering that we encounter. And there's all these different things that we as Christians experience on a daily basis. And Paul's point is that when those things come up, you need to be prophesying so there's strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. That's his point. We need to have a message that is clear. We need to be ministering to one another in such a way where they walk out of here and they walk out of community group or they walk out of that lunch meeting where they're like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Look what he says next. He says, and it's like the exact opposite, because prophecy, the focus is 100% on, on the other person. It's loving. It helps them. However, tongues is the exact opposite. Look what he says. He says, the person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, builds himself up, it's the same Greek word as strengthening that we just looked at in verse 3. He says, the person who speaks in tongues, he's focused on strengthening and supporting and soothing himself, which I would say is 100% needful. Church family, we must, hey, listen, the most powerful voice in your world is your own. You speak more to yourself than anyone does. And that's why we need to be studying the scripture. That's why we need to be memorizing scripture. That's why we need to be fasting and praying because you are the most powerful voice in your little world. And I hope I'm being clear here. As we talk about, punk, as we talk about tongues... Paul's not saying that tongues are evil. Did you catch that? Look at the verse. Look at verse 5. He says, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. I wish is kind of a strong statement, don't you think? It's a big deal. I mean, think about it right now. Think about it. A little break. Think about something that you're wishing for right now. Think about it. You got it? What are you wishing for? What are you wishing for? What are you wishing for? Do you have one? Do you have one? Owen, what's yours? What are you wishing for? You didn't have one. Oh, man, uh, you're grounded. <laughs> grounded. Andreas, what are you wishing for? What is it? Steak. steak. Oh, man, okay, okay. Hey, he's wishing for steak. 
He's wishing for steak. George, what are you wishing for? If someone was wishing for something, shout it out right now. What, what is it? New car? Okay, yeah, new car. Steak. Anybody else? A Panthers win. Oh, man, you're dreaming now. You're not wishing. You're dreaming. <laughs> Those are all awesome things. I want a steak. I want a car. I want the Panthers to win. I got it out for you, for you. Now, those are all awesome things. But, but listen, Paul, Paul's wish, and, and typically that's what we wish for, guys. That's what we wish for, and I'm not down in that. Like, we wish for those kind of things. We, th- we wish for physical things. I need more money. I need a better car. I need to pay off this. I need to pay off that. I need a good grade. Nothing wrong with those things. But Paul wishes every Christian in Corinth had the gift of tongues because if every Christian was building themselves up in the faith, they're going to go a whole long way for the kingdom. That's why he's wishing that. If every person is speaking truth to themselves in the right way, like they're going to do powerful things. The problem, though, with tongues is the emphasis had been given... um, over everything else, like they were, they were pushing, the church of Corinth was, was pushing tongues so strongly that, again, people are walking into the church, and they're like, hey, have you had a tongue lately? And they're just feeling beat down. They're like, no, I haven't. And it's creating that tension. It's creating that division. So because of that, look what Paul goes on to say. He says, I wish even more, though, even more. I wish even more. I really wish, I really wish, like, I wish I had a steak, but I really wish I had steak and lobster. I wish I had a new car, but I really wish I had an SUV. I wish the Panthers would win, but I really wish the Patriots would win. He's building here. And he's building towards something that's greater and more important. And he's like, I I wish even more that you prophesied, because the person who prophesied, get this, huge, underline this, is greater than the person who speaks in tongues. Unless he interprets so that the church may be built up. It has a greater impact. It has a greater ministry based upon everything we've already said in verses 3 and 4. So if we're going to do ministry rightly so that we can reach the culture missionally, it starts with my mindset must be cogent. Look at number, second point is this, verses 6 through 12, or my message must be cogent. 6 through 12 is my mindset must be constructive. My mindset must be constructive. If you're going to do ministry rightly, the attitude you must have when it comes to ministry must be constructive. You want to use the gifts that God has given you. You want to use the talents that you have, not for yourself, but for the sole purpose of building others up. Listen, when it comes to platform ministry especially, like this isn't an opportunity for me to pitch myself. Like the platform and, and like worship Like, man, the platform in churches has become very dangerous. Pastors and worship leaders and worship teams have used this to to make a big deal about themselves. And Paul's like going after that mindset. Any ministry that you might have, the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, whatever God has given you, you are to steward for a purpose. And that purpose is other people and to build them up. So Paul shares three reasons our mindset must be constructive. Here they go. Number one, verse six, the benefit of the body. Here's why our mindset must be constructive. Here's why my attitude must be, I want to I wanna build them up. It's because when that's our mindset, there's benefit. There's benefit. Verse six, so now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you with a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? I'll write this down. I want to encourage you to write this down. Please do. My ministry is about the body, not me. I hope you get that. I hope you know that. I hope you'll own that. I need to own that. We all need to own that. The ministry that we do is about the body, not me. You see, when it came to spiritual gifts and when it came to tongues, tongues was a wow factor gift in the church at Corinth. If a person walked into the church and just started speaking in tongues, people would have been shocked and be like, you are an amazingly gifted person. Like, you're a big deal. 
And as amazing as the gift of tongues is, and really think about that for a minute. Let's just TV time out. Think about the gift of tongues. Like, put yourself in the first century church and imagine like Acts chapter 2 style tongues where people are going out. Because remember what Corinth was. Corinth was a very diverse community, right? It had Greeks. It had Romans. It was a, it was a strategically located place. That's why Paul was all about pouring in 18 months into Corinth so that they could do some hardcore discipleship and the gospel would flourish. But people from all over that known world would have been passing through Corinth and there are Corinthian Christians going out into the city and they're speaking in tongues and they're evangelized people and, they're, and it's like, whoa, that's a big, that's awesome. So they're coming back and they're high five and they're like, yeah, man, I had six saved this week. I spoke to a French, I spoke to an Italian, I spoke to a Spaniard, I spoke to an Englishman and they're just like counting it off like, this is awesome. And then they're looking at others in the church, they're like, why aren't you doing that? What's your deal? How come you don't have the gift? And again, remember, there's hierarchy, which is creating tension, and it's creating division. But as amazing as that gift is, Paul says, when you come into the church and your emphasis is on tongues, look at what he says. He says, it doesn't build up, so it's not a benefit I remember when I served at this one church, and um, they decided one year they were going to do a, a cantata, and the cantata that they were going to sing for Christmas was all in Latin. You, some of you know where this is going. Like, oh, we know where this is going. You're a dumb job. Yeah, that's where it's going. Like, the whole cantata was in Latin. It pains me to think, even to this day, that I wasted an hour and a half of my life listening to Latin music because nothing was gained. Nothing was gained, I'm sorry. There was no benefit. I wasn't encouraged spiritually. I didn't walk out of there appreciating Christ in a greater way. And that's Paul's point to the Corinthians, right there. Nothing is gained for the brother or sister in Christ who's sitting in the pew listening to a language that they can't understand. Nothing's gained. Nothing beneficial. And although tongues was valued, he's not knocking tongues. Tongues was valued. He's not knocking tongues. It's for your spiritual benefit. It's for the outreach of others. He's not knocking tongues. Tongues was valued. But it's not beneficial in the church because nothing was brought to bear on the person's life in the church. It's not helpful. And listen, church family, when we do ministry, the whole purpose for ministry is so that others might gain something. That's Paul's point. We want to be people who minister in such a way where the recipients are benefiting from our ministry. They walk out encouraged and edified and strengthened and valued. And let me just say, that's why we have things like equip classes. And that's why we have small groups and ladies studies and men's studies. And next Saturday, men come out to our men's breakfast. Like, it's, it, it's value. It provides value to your life. You're going to be strengthened. Your benefit, our benefit collectively, is why we minister. It's not about me. And tongues wasn't communicating in a way that was beneficial. Notice the second reason our mindset must be constructive. The knowledge of the body. The knowledge of the body. Verse 7, even lifeless instruments that produce sounds, whether flute or harp, if they don't make a distinction in the notes, how will what is played on the flute or harp be recognized? In fact, the bugle makes an unclear sound. Who will prepare for battle? Now, I couldn't find a bugle or a harp. But I found a flute and a horn. So Dave, come on up. Miriam, come on up. I found a flute and I found a horn. And let me ask these wind instrumist extraordinaires a couple questions. Can this, mu can this instrument make music on its own? Yes or no? no? No. The answer was no. Can't make music on its own. Does the person who plays this instrument always make the correct music? Miriam is laughing. Who would like Miriam to play us something? I value my marriage more than I value your opinion, so she won't. But I hope you heard their answers. Doesn't make music on its own. Doesn't always make correct music. And that's Paul's point. If the instrument is played correctly, the instrument doesn't communicate if it's not played correctly, excuse me, 
it doesn't communicate in a way that's helpful. And he goes on to explain, look at verse 8, he goes on to explain that the bugle was the instrument that was used in order to sound an alarm for the army. And the message had to be clear to the army. Why did it have to be clear? So that they could respond to the message in the right way. So it probably sounded something like this. This is what Paul's envisioning. It's got to be louder, man. We're storming the hill. One more time. Charge, yeah. All right, thank you guys. Hey, can we thank them? Now listen, that's Paul's point right there. A clear signal. The army needs a clear signal. Charge. We're charging the hill. It's got to be clear. I got to know what's being said. It's got to be communicated rightly so that we could get after it. And so after sharing that illustration, notice Paul's connection. He says, in the same way, unless you use your tongue for intelligible speech, how will what is spoken be known? For you'll be just speaking into the air. Unless what you're saying is clear and attainable for the listener, it's not helpful. A tongue without interpretation has no benefit, just like the instrument that doesn't play the right notes. How is that constructive? But the opposite is true of prophecy. That's Paul's point. The opposite is true of prophecy. Prophecy is clear. Prophecy is intelligible, it's helpful, it's inspirational, it sparks within us a desire to to be missional. So Paul's like, get after it. And then notice the third reason our mindset must be constructive, the growth of the body. The growth of the body. We see in verses 10 through 12, I'll just read them. There are doubtless many different kinds of languages in the world, none is without meaning. Therefore, I do not know the meaning of the language. I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. I remember going to Italy. Going to Italy, I'm trying to communicate. The Italian people are the best. They're so loving. They're so much fun. And, and like, you just want to like be with them. And you want to like forget the interpreter. And you want to talk with them. And so, good, good evening. Does anyone know Italian in here? Good evening. Nobody. All right, perfect. So I'm the authority. This is the best situation for this illustration right here. Nobody knows Italian. So like I'm right, right? Good evening is buena serata. Buena serata. And then good morning is buongiorno. And so the whole night, I'm walking around, buongiorno, buongiorno, buongiorno. People are looking at me like, who is this Irish nut? The Irish need to stay in Ireland. Hey, I didn't defame America, all right? They thought I was Irish. Although my words were intelligible, they were not meaningful. They were not helpful, and that's Paul's point about tongues. The language is real, but it's not helpful to the listener. So with that in mind, he writes verse 12. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, Seek to excel in building up the church. Growth is the goal of our gifting. Right there. I hope you understand that. That's Paul's point. Growth is the goal of our gifting. God has gifted each one of us for the purpose of church growth. Not necessarily numeric growth, although that's awesome. It's for deep growth. Colossians chapter 2 kind of growth, where it talks about being firmly rooted and built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather than focusing on tongues that are unintelligible and uninspirational and unhelpful to the listener that doesn't know the language, Paul's like, focus on attaining something that will be helpful to the body. Listen, church family, we're to be zealous for this. Are you zealous to exercise the gifts that God has given you individually to strengthen our church family so that we might be equipped and encouraged and inspired to leave this place and reach our culture missionally? Are you zealous about those gifts? Are you using them on a regular basis? Loved ones, that's our calling. You're gifted for a purpose. And that purpose is to build the king's kingdom. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. I just want to ask a couple questions as we close our time from God's word today. The first group of questions is for Christians. How is your gifting seen in you? How is your gifting seen in you? Are you using them for others? Or are you using them for yourself? Second question is, are you you encouraging others in their giftedness? 
Like when you see faithful people, do you walk up to them and say, hey man, I, I, I saw the way that God's using you. I saw what you did. I just want to encourage you. I want to just build you up. I know ministry can be hard sometimes. But are you encouraging others to exercise their gifts? Are you thanking them for their faithful stewardship of their gifts? Second question is for those of you who are here today that are checking out Christianity, and, and the biggest question for you is, have you accepted God's gift? Have you accepted the, the greatest gift of eternal life? If you've never done that, and that's something that you'd like to do today, just raise your hand right now, and I'll make a connection with you after our service, and I'll make sure you can know, beyond a shadow of doubt, how you can know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and how you can be given that gift today. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be used for the kingdom of God. It's baffling to think that the holy God of the universe, the one that sent his son to die for us because we were in need of a savior, and even upon our salvation, the fact that we so often are unfaithful and inconsistent in our walk with you. It's, it's, it's crazy to think that because of your love and your mercy and your grace that you want to use us. And so God, I pray that we as a church family, I pray that we will be faithful to do what Paul is calling us to do here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That we will be faithful and we will be pursuing hard after and that we might be seeking love and desiring spiritual gifts so that we can make an impact all for the purpose of your glory in Christ's name we pray Amen Hey church let's stand let's finish this today by lifting our voices With a thousand voices, the thousand voice to live one cry from north to south, then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified.
Let me finish what I'm saying, all right? And, and so, like, so here's the thing. Like, what, what I learned in high school, in, in a situation like this, you just, like, mouth watermelon, right? Remember that? Like, that wouldn't have worked for him. But I just was, like, saying, I'm like, that is so cool that Matt's leading the song right now because he got the words right, and maybe he would have gotten them right too. But, like, God saw fit to have him leading for that moment, and he was equipped. And I use that just to illustrate something, just this simple point right here. If you surrender yourself to the Lord, don't worry about the what ifs and the what nots. But if you surrender yourself to do ministry, the Lord will empower you to do ministry. And I was really blessed by that, and I appreciate you. They're coming into membership next week. We have several people coming into membership next week, and that's super, super exciting because next week marks seven years of vertical church. Seven years of vertical church. We have, we have a lot going on next week. Uh, we have our anniversary offering, and we're, we're praying that above and beyond our normal tithes and offerings, it's a special gift, kind of like an Easter gift or a Christmas gift, that you might give faithfully, generously, sacrificially to this. We're, we're praying for $20,000. Um, 17000 of it is going outside of our church. Thirteen dollars is going to Iran so that we can plant three more house churches in Iran, which is awesome. And then 4000 will go down to Nicaragua for our Vintage Mission Partnership down there. And then 3000 will stay at home to do some things to our kids' ministry and our student ministry room that are needful so that they can do ministry the right way in that room. But pray about what the Lord might have you to give um, as far as that goes. Then second, everybody grab their phone right now. Go to the Church Center app. I really need you to do this. All right, grab your phone. I'm not going anywhere. Get your phone up. Come on, sword drill style with your phone. Come on. If you're, if you're a visitor, don't worry about it. Ignore me. Everybody else, get your phone. All right, go to the Church Center app. Click on events. And you got a couple options there. The first one is our men's breakfast. That's next Saturday morning at 730. Guys, I want to encourage you to come. If you have a boy in your home, maybe starting at the age of, say, eight years old, bring him to this. Have them come for breakfast. I know it's a little bit early on Saturday. It doesn't matter. Come with your boy. Show them the importance of we as men, we need to gather together to just have some man talks from God's word and be encouraged, all right, and eat some good breakfast. I know you're going to enjoy that part of it as well and be encouraged through God's word. But we need you to sign up for that, okay, so that we can plan appropriate for that. And then second, next Sunday we have an anniversary dinner, we're calling it, the anniversary dinner. 
what I do with my wife on our anniversary, but we're going to be on a date together right out there next week, our entire church family. We're going to celebrate God's favor and his kindness of seven years. He's done so many amazing things, and we want to celebrate those things. And, and listen, we're trying to spoil you a little bit. We have a catered lunch prepared for you, and you're really going to enjoy it. And I'm going to click on this right now because I don't know what that catered lunch is. I forget what it is. It's, it's catered by Red Radish Caters, who are really good, by the way. And we've got Baked Ziti, grilled chicken and salad. Uh, it's going to be a great meal. What we need you to do, though, is to bring the dessert, okay? All you got to do is bring the dessert. Everything else is taken care of. So if every family that's attending could bring a dessert, the meal is free. And uh, I know it's going to be a great day together next Sunday. And hopefully we'll be able to count our offering amount and celebrate that together. And I'm just going to be sharing um, some cool things God's done the last seven years and what I believe maybe the future for us is for these, maybe these next seven years. Who knows? All right. And then ladies, next week starts the new women's study um, called Voice of God. And what we're talking about is how to read the Bible in a way that you can hear from the Lord because these are his words and how you can grow in your understanding of God's word. So please sign up for that if you're interested in that class. And we have a morning class and an evening class. So if you're working in the morning, you can sign up for the evening class. I believe that's going to be on Sunday. And then the morning class, I think it's on Tuesday morning or something like that. But just check that out. I know you'll be blessed by that. And then if you're checking out Vertical Church, we do have a membership class that's coming up. And that's on October 16th. It's from 4 to 7. We cover nursery. We cover dinner. And it's a great opportunity for you to hear about our vision and our values and what God's doing uh, here at Vertical church. Let's stand together. Let's close our time um, just reprising that awesome song about our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's sing. Oh Christ. Oh Christ be magnified. Yes, let his praise arise. Oh Christ be magnified. Church family, it's so good to worship with you today. We'll see you back here next weekend to celebrate our anniversary Sunday. You are loved, you are sent.